November is the month to explore Pearland's dining scene with Pearland Restaurant Weeks. From Boiling Dragon's famous dragon seafood fried rice to your new favorite chicken fried chicken at Magnolia Cajun Comfort, there's a Pearland restaurant to satisfy every palate. Support small and discover neighborhood gems in Pearland this fall with Pearland Restaurant Weeks running November 1st through the 30th. See the menus at visitpearland.com slash restaurantweeks and start planning your weekend today. Houston's biggest international and independent film festival is finally here. The 16th annual Houston Cinema Arts Festival runs through November 17th with over 40 unique film events, workshops, performances, and more. Don't miss the new documentary Dory Previn On My Way to Where, featuring a live performance of her songs and a workshop with producer and Rice alum Amy Hobby. Plus, check out the Cine Space showcase of short films made with NASA archival footage. Get your all-access passes for all the screenings, exclusive parties, and more at cinemahtx.org slash hcaf. Single tickets are available too. Today on CityCast Houston, the Astrodome's been closed for 15 years, but there's a new plan to revamp our historic eighth wonder of the world. It seems like we've been through this before, so will something actually get done this time to save this landmark? Plus, how different would election results for county races have looked if voters actually finished their ballots? And this one really gets me. Why are police response times the worst since the 1990s? Houston Landing's diverse communities reporter Monique Welch joins me to break down those stories and more. It's Friday, November 15th. I'm Rahil Ramzan Ali, and here's what Houston's talking about. Hey, Monique, what's up? Happy Friday. Hey, Rahil. I know. Friday's finally here. Glad to be here. I'm so excited to chat with you, and I'm going to put you on the spot right out the gate. Oh, boy. I know you're not a Houston native, but you got here as fast as you could, of course. What do you know about the Astrodome? Like, tell me your history with the Astrodome quickly. Uh I mean, even like a couple years in, I still hadn't heard about the Astrodome. So that goes the show. I only learned of it about a year and a half ago. Uh, mainly, of course, you know, you get news tips, you hear things just being plugged into the community. And I was like, wait, I think the first thing that came to my mind was like, wow, this is this is still sitting dormant for all these years. That's incredible. Just knowing kind of Houston's history with tearing stuff down. I was like, how how has this been able to stand the test of time? So Peel back the layers and uh, just kind of looked at some of the re- restoration efforts from the conservancy. And yeah, they're hanging on. See, I'm glad you brought that up because Houstonians who grew up here in the 80s, they remember the Astrodome as the place, right? It was the eighth wonder of the world. It's awesome. For me, I went and watched WrestleMania 17 at the Astrodome. That was my first time ever stepping into the building. It's such a historic building for memories, right? But I think people forget that. It's really not that important anymore. It's just an old building. And I'm glad you brought that up. Like, you didn't even know about it. So Mm -hmm. it is a big part of the city's history, but it's not as important as people make it out to be. And I know I'm going to get a lot of hate for this one. I was going to say, what a bold statement there. (laughs) (laughs) And of course, that's where the Houston Astros played, right? The Astrodome. And it was the eighth wonder of the world, as I mentioned. It was an iconic stadium when it was built. But it's been closed since 2009, and we still haven't figured out what to do with it. It's been the subject of debate among Houstonians and politicians about what we should do with the Astrodome. When I was working in sports radio on slow summer days when we had nothing to talk about, you know what we would literally do is just say, hey, what should we do with the Astrodome? And we would get calls for hours, Monique. Oh, my goodness. That's insane. Yeah, it's insane how divisive the Astrodome has become for the city. But now, all right, we have a new billion dollar plan from the Astrodome Conservancy Group, and we might finally get something done here. It's called Vision Astrodome, and it could cost about a billion dollars. It's a massive proposal to completely redevelop 450,000 square feet of space. It would build four state-of-the-art buildings under the Astrodome's iconic roof. And it's going to look kind of like High Line in New York, which reimagined an old railroad line into a public park. And it's really cool because it's elevated and it's one of the must-see things in New York now. 
But this would create a boulevard that would cut through the Astrodome and connect existing buildings at NRG Park. There would be room for about 1,500 additional parking spots and animal <laughs> handling facilities that could be located under a new ground floor for the Houston Rodeo. But look, I don't think anything is going to get done, Monique, unfortunately, because again, we get these proposals and ideas like every couple of years. Yeah, I mean, the track record certainly isn't great, but I mean, still, it sounds exciting just with what they're trying to do. I think the first thing that's going to come to mind for any Houstonian is, of course, like you said, why are we still talking about this? What will be kind of the burden on taxpayers? But I mean, I was reading that they're kind of hoping to attract significant private dollars. My question, and I'm just wondering, okay, who who are, will be the private donors and who will be interested in uh, putting up big bucks to see this through? Yeah, that's the other thing, right? Funding for this project. We always hear about like, why not just tear it down or strip it down and make it into a park and, you know, kind of make it really unique and make it an attraction to go there. We always get these ideas, but funding is a big issue. The second part of all of this, the Houston Texans, who are, of course, playing at NRG Stadium right now, and the Houston Rodeo, which is the other tenant for that complex that Harris County owns, they have this lease agreement with Harris County, and they kind of own the Astrodome as well. And there's always this back and forth of like, why would we mess up things the way they are? Why do we need to do anything here? Just leave it as is. Parking is important. Would this eat into their parking space? And then the other part, Monique, do we really need more retail space? There's so much retail space in the city of Houston. Yeah, I mean, I completely forgot about that part. You know, growing up, my mom would always say, don't have too many cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> it yeah. kind of sounds like there are a lot of cooks in this kitchen. So it'll be interesting to see, does that remain? Some people leave the kitchen. I don't know. But hopefully the right thing is done. Yeah. As someone who grew up here and I I would always look at the Astrodome as this really cool place and I would go to Astro World, which by the way is long gone, right? <laughs> and it, look, the Astrodome, if they were to strip it down, maybe just take out the panels, make it into a cool park, that would be nice. But this new concept, I get it. They want to do something with it. They want to keep the building around. It's important to a lot of Houstonians, but there's just like, would it really be a marquee destination? Would it be a place where Houstonians gather? Would people want to go look at this new redeveloped complex, right? There's just so many things at play here. To me, I've always been just go ahead and tear it down. All right, just tear it down. They've torn down more historic stadiums like old Yankee Stadium. That's long gone, right? There's so much history there and they just tore it down. I think you can do that with the Astrodome as well. I mean, the history part is probably what's going to be taken over the edge. I've always been a huge proponent of history, so there's certainly an argument there. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, when you compare it to the High Line in New York, it's like, okay, well, how how much of history are we keeping? That's the first thing that comes to my mind. I know our executive producer, Laura Isensey, when we were talking about this story, she is all about like, hey, let's just renovate it, do something with it. We do not need to tear it down. Houston tears down way too much of our history. So it can be a really cool spot for people to go to. So there's just so much back and forth. And I would love to get people's comments on this as well. We've put our contact info in the show notes. And of course, you can DM us on Instagram at CityCast Houston. Hey, Monique, what was your big story of the week? Yeah, so mine is the latest uh, from my colleagues, Paul Cobbler and Jose Luis Martinez. They reported that tens of thousands of Harris County residents stopped voting well short of the end of their November 5th ballots. So that means they skipped dozens of races and passed out the opportunity to change the outcome of all but one countywide contest. It's actually called undervoting. And they found that the number of people that left races blank varied by contest. In Harris County, each voter had between roughly 50 and 70 contests on the individual ballot. And so data shows that as voters moved down the ballot, that gap just generally grew wider and wider. Numerous contests were decided by a few thousand votes, but skipped by more than 100,000 voters. Wow. So that is just like voting fatigue or is it... I don't know enough about this race, so I have no say in this. Do we know why this happened? There's really no evidence that points to an exact reason or another. Um, it, all we know is that really there were just a bunch of countywide races that could have been affected by this. One example would be uh, the question of whether to raise the property tax rate for the Harris County Flood Control District. That was a big deal and would have a huge impact here locally. 
In that race, a little over 144,000 voters did not make a selection, and the winning margin was 39,198 votes. Rio. Oh. So that could have totally been flipped if everyone had voted and if it was higher on the ballot as well. I get it. It's tough. Like when you go in and you have that many races to vote on, I have to put myself in my old shoes when I wasn't working in news and when I was just working a nine to five and it was election time, I would always hear like, yeah, research the ballot, everything that we've talked about here on CityCast Houston, get your notes ready, look it up, research it, all that good stuff. But people don't have time and people don't have that much interest, especially when it's 50 to 70 races, right? Yeah. It gets exhausting. So I understand like why people just undervoted, but now I'm torn. Like, would you rather them not vote or would you rather they blindly vote on a candidate they have no information on? I know. And I guess that's just a question we're going to have to live with. I, I've, like you, thought about the same thing, tried to take my reporter hat off and like, OK, if, if I wasn't, I guess, as civically engaged as I am, I probably would feel the same way as far as fatigue goes, but yeah. I would rather exhaust that fatigue earlier um, before actually voting. Because what I do, I take the time on the weekend right before early voting is about to start. And I go down my ballot just to see how long it is first. I'm like, OK, so I know how what's my cutoff that I have to <laughs> procrastinate <laughs> and how to plan my time so I can spend time in research. Once I do that, you know, I do all my research, I mark my sample ballot and I take my sample ballot to the polls. So voting in the polls really still takes a matter of minutes at that point. Um, but of course, that's assuming that everyone does that. And I'm almost sure not everyone does, as we see by the data. So it just just pins. Yeah, the data speaks for itself. And, you know, I was thinking about this after we voted. My wife was like, what was this race about? What was this one about? And I even called my mom and I always use her as a measuring stick of like, OK, what do you remember about voting on this year's ballot? And she's like, there's just so many races. I just picked one person like randomly almost. Right. Yeah. And I asked her, would it be different for you if there was just a little explanation on the ballot about what this position will do? Would that help you make a better decision? And she said, no, I still don't know who the person is. Right. If you don't research, what's the point? <laughs> and by the way, this is almost like a re-education, Monique, for voters, because this is the second general election since the Texas legislature got rid of straight ticket voting, right? They abolished that process. So in 2016, more than three quarters of voters in Harris County just went straight ticket. And after that, the legislature was like, uh-uh, we're, we're getting rid of this process. Mm -hmm. So there's still this education process of learning that, no, you can't just click one button and all of a sudden you're good and you're out the door, you got to go through the process and pick whichever party you want and their candidate for that position. Yeah, for sure. I explained my process. So I'm very thorough, obviously. But, you know, we were talking to our parents and um, you can tell that there's not that much energy being spent on the research is maybe research done for half of the candidates and the rest, they just go down the ballot of their particular party. So you have some yeah. voters who do that. Then you have some voters, of course, who just getting in the vote might be a stretch. So they're like, hey, just take it or leave it. This is all I can do. So yeah. it's really interesting. Definitely interesting numbers. And I, I would like to compare it to previous years. I didn't see anything regarding previous years. Uh, in much of the reporting. So I, I will dig into that a little bit and find out, is it just now because there's just more races? Is there just more going on? People just don't care. There's apathy, whatever it may be. Um, yeah, these numbers are definitely fascinating. Yeah, well, we do know that voter turnout has been down in the last several elections. So I wonder what uh, relationship that has with this as well. One thing I love about Houston is that it's full of amazing stories. Here's one that I just learned about. In 1940, a girl named Ruth Steinfeld and her family were deported from Germany to one of the first Nazi concentration camps in France. She and her sister managed to escape with the help of a rescue group and Ruth ended up making a life here in Houston. Now her portrait is part of a new exhibit called Facing Survival by David Casson. The exhibit memorializes over 24 survivors at Holocaust Museum Houston and they really make you think about the resiliency of the human spirit. 
Facing Survival is on view now through January 5th at Holocaust Museum Houston. And the museum is free on Thursdays from 2 to 5 p.m. And kids 18 and under and college students are always free at Holocaust Museum Houston. Learn more at hmh.org slash facing survival. Houston's original neighborhood, downtown is for everyone. And right now is the perfect time to start a new Saturday tradition with the Market Square Park Farmer's Market. Every Saturday until November 16th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., you can enjoy this great weather that we're having and walk the farmer's market like I do and check out all of the local growers and makers as they provide access to seasonally fresh and affordable fruit and vegetables, plus meat proteins and prepared foods, as well as other household goods. The best part? The Market Square Park Farmer's Market is in collaboration with Central City Co-op, which is Houston's oldest organic sustainable food co-op. There are several parking options, and it is accessible by the Metro Rail so you can easily get to it. You can also enjoy live music performances by local artists and other entertainment so the entire family can have fun. Learn more at downtownhouston.org. Downtown Houston, get energized and revived. All right, Monique, let's get to our most overlooked stories of the week. What do you got for me? Yeah, so this is actually one of my latest on Tuesday. The Harris County LGBTQIA Plus Commission, they came out with their first biennial report outlining key initiatives and listed a bunch of policy recommendations so that the county can improve the quality of life for its LGBTQIA plus community. Now, if you're not familiar with this commission, it was formed back in June 2023 under Precinct 4 Commissioner Leslie Briona's office, uh, basically to provide actionable guidance to Harris County Commissioner's Court on certain policies and initiatives they can take to better serve uh, the county's LGBTQIA plus residents and to promote equality and justice. Some of those key initiatives include a holding a large scale town hall, a banned book fair, which we all know has been a big deal lately in the last several years, expanding partnerships with law enforcement to boost cultural competency, and fostering health initiatives to combat HIV, which in Harris County has exceeded um, Texas and the U.S. So that's a big deal here. Oh, wow. I did not know that. That's such an important one right there, right? Just the health initiative itself. So do we know which of these initiatives are going to be enacted first? So I spoke with Vice Chair Brandon Mack uh, on Wednesday after they presented, and there's no particular chronological order to this. They really just want to see action within the next year. And when I mean action, some of those recommendations, um, they're going to start with more concrete things like collecting local data through a quality of life survey. That way they can learn some of the experiences of residents living in the county and kind of how they feel and the resources provided by the county. Um, Then they're also going into that cultural competency conversation with uh, Harris County Sheriff's Office, going to try to basically be a liaison and re-implement that position within the Sheriff's Office to have someone uh, to advocate for the community. And then from there, they want to also develop a pipeline of qualified LGBTQIA plus residents for county boards and commissions and boost investments in county community centers. I love that one. Boosting that funding for community centers is so important, right? Because that's where you can create a hub for the health initiatives, for any sort of community projects. Like those community centers are so, so important. Yeah, I mean, they're really vital for the whole spectrum of resources and activities. Uh, For this particular recommendation, they really kind of pinned it behind what we're seeing at university, public universities and colleges like University of Houston, for example, which had to close their LGBTQ resource center. Um, And so now they're like, well, where is this community supposed to convene? And um, where else can the rest of the community kind of learn Mm -hmm. about the diversity of this community? So they're hoping to use the community centers as a gathering space as well, since they have lost some of those centers on, on college campuses. Monique, when you were reporting on this story, when you talk to people in the community, specifically in the LGBTQIA plus community, is Harris County overall a safe and positive place for the community? Uh, The notion I got, I didn't talk to people directly for this one, but just talking to Brandon Mack, uh, they went around and did a bunch of listening sessions throughout this year, and they heard a lot of 
things as far as how Karis County can be better. Not necessarily saying that it's bad, um, just that they want to see, for example, things like more mental health resources, um, better yeah. cultural competency for uh, Harris County Sheriff's Office, especially when dealing with trans people, you know, and knowing how to interact with them. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the big things. I love that. Anything that we can do to make every person in our community feel more accepted, safer, more engaged in the community. I love it for everyone. Okay, my most overlooked story is that response times from the Houston Police Department have gotten slower this year across all types of calls. Now, HPD categorizes their calls into levels of priority, one through five, and all of them have gotten slower. So for example, my dad's perfume store on Harwin, which was broken into last month, there were two thieves who hooked up a truck to his steel crime prevention bars and then ripped them off and the alarm went off. Well, that was labeled as a priority to call and the average response for those types of crimes went from 11.3 to 11.7 in 2024. And these response times are the slowest since the 90s, Monique, when they average four to six minutes for most calls and have gotten slower in recent years. Now, this wasn't shocking to me, especially since we just went through it as a family, but we've also heard the lack of personnel has been a major issue for HPD. Yeah, that's kind of hard to wrap your head around, especially you think about the 90s and the time then you have to just put into perspective just how how much things have improved since then. And the fact that the mm -hmm. numbers are going in the opposite direction uh, aren't really a good sign. Yeah, they're not. And the lack of personnel has been a big issue, right? We've heard new Chief Noe Diaz talk about trying to recruit more officers. And it also works hand in hand with what's been happening with HPD because they had to allocate personnel to help review and close the 264,000 cases that were marked as suspended due to lack of personnel, which was a huge scandal. Plus, they already didn't have enough officers. And we're also a bigger city now. Like, there's just more people right. here. And there's just so many factors that go into this. So Chief Diaz has his work cut out for him. Yeah, he certainly does. But I think he probably knew that going into it, right? Just mm -hmm. given the scandals that HPD has had. Yeah. So uh, it's definitely has work cut out for him. It's just interesting given the focus that uh, Mayor Whitmire has put on HPD and just public safety in general. These numbers certainly don't look good. Yeah, this is definitely going to be one of the things that will define, in my opinion, Mayor Whitmire's administration, like what they do with HPD, if the times get better, if they can find more officers, all of that stuff kind of works hand in hand coming out of the scandal as well. This is a big, big deal for Mayor Whitmire. The Museum of Fine Arts Houston presents Living with the Gods, Arts, Beliefs and Peoples. To celebrate its centennial, the museum has organized a once-in-a-lifetime exhibition that features extraordinary objects made by artists to communicate with their gods. Living with the Gods represents a vast array of religions and beliefs, with art created across cultures and across thousands of years. The 200 objects demonstrate the astonishing quality that artists have achieved when driven by passion and faith. Living with the Gods is on view from October 27th through January 20th, 2025. Visit mfah.org slash livingwiththegods to learn more. That's mfah.org slash livingwiththegods. Run a restaurant and you learn pretty quick. The sound of a crisp fry starts way before the first bite. As delivery into go keeps business booming... Order for pickup... McCain Sure Crisp fries keep orders crispy. Hey, delivery. After the trip, the crispiness comes through. Mmm. McCain Sure Crisp fries go the distance. See how far our fries can take your business at surecrisp.com slash delivery. All right, Monique, let's get to our moment of joy. What made you happy this week? What are you celebrating? Not necessarily celebrating anything, but Afrotech is in Houston for the very first time. Not sure if you heard of it, Raheel, but for those who... No, what is it? Yeah, for those who are unfamiliar, it's a global conference and really the largest tech conference for Black professionals in the world. 
This is a big deal and pretty exciting because when you think about Houston, historically, it hasn't been in those conversations as far as having a big reputation for technology. You think of tech hubs like San Francisco and our neighbors in Austin, for example, as being go-to places. So Afrotech has previously held conferences there, um, but organizers told me that tech innovation is emerging here and that now is just the right time for them to give Houston its turn. Hey, I love that. Look at that. We're a great city for major events and conferences. And now for the first time, Afrotech is going to be here. Will you have a chance to go check out any of it? So it's actually happening right now. Um, it started on Wednesday. I went on opening day, which was Wednesday evening. And I'd heard about it a briefly just because my husband kind of works in that field and he's gone to a couple in the last several years. So I had a chance to kind of hear about his experience last year in Austin, um, but I, I was never on the grounds myself. So it was interesting to see it. And of course, I'm in my own city and man, I had no idea how cool it was going to be. Yeah. I mean, me, you know, a journalist and reporter, I have nothing to do with tech, nor will I ever. <laughs> but um, <laughs> just they had so much going on. There was like an outdoor culture park stage with a live DJ. And of course, the, the weather has finally cooled down. So that was nice. Um, nice breeze flowing, different food trucks, a bunch of like just great businesses, vendors, you name it. And that was just outside. Indoors, oh, it was so packed cool. at the George R. Brown Convention Center. Um, and quickly, they, their opening ceremony became standing room only just to kind of be in the room and hear about all the interactive workshops they had planned and just the general excitement. Um, and to me, honestly, just to be surrounded by so much Black excellence and intelligence, it was really refreshing. That is amazing. That is so cool that they picked Houston and celebrating our thriving community here as well. So shout out to them. And I love that for the city. Okay, my moment of joy is that CityCast Houston guest and hype-free meteorologist Matt Lanza is joining Centerpoint Energy as the manager of meteorology to help with their emergency preparedness and response, focusing on outages. Now, Matt and Eric Berger built a cult following with Space City Weather. We love them here. I think everyone loves them across the board because they delivered hype-free forecasts, especially during hurricane season. Now, Matt will still be working on Space City Weather, but the reason this is my moment of joy, Monique, is because in a time where Centerpoint's public relations with the community seem to be at an all-time low, this is a great local hire who can help maybe make better decisions and help serve our community better. Yeah, I mean, can't lie, didn't see this on my bingo card, but no. <laughs> I mean, it's a major win um, for Centerpoint, but more so Houstonians. Like you said, public trust uh, with Centerpoint has just dropped immensely since Hurricane Barrel. And hopefully having a very trusted name um, in Matt Lanza will help improve that. Um, and mm -hmm. certainly help them prepare better, which is what we all want. Yeah, I just hope that he can help Centerpoint regain trust and really help our community. When he posted on X about his new job, the comments I thought were going to be brutal. I thought people were going to be like, really, Same. Centerpoint? Blah. But it was all positive because Matt is such a nice person. And that was the overwhelming response. It was, I really hope Centerpoint is making strides and regaining our trust and hiring the right people, and we can't wait for this. So th that was good to see. Yeah, I mean, Matt Lanza is such a, a nice guy. Like, who can ever have any beef with him, you know? So yeah. I think it's just a huge win. Um, for him personally, I thanked him, I know, on social media, and it was really nice to see the overwhelming support he got. Same here. That was a lot of fun, Monique. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a great weekend. Enjoy this somewhat cooler weather, okay? Yeah, looking forward to it. You too. That was Monique Welch. You can read her work on HoustonLanding.org. Plus, I've linked all the stories we talked about today in our show notes. A big thanks to everyone who shared CityCast Houston with their friends this week. And if you haven't yet, please share this episode with three friends and be sure to rate and review our podcast wherever you listen. And do me a favor and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss an episode. Thanks. You can also get more Houston news, events, and happenings in our daily newsletter, Hey Houston. Sign up with the info in our show notes. That will do it for this week here on CityCast Houston. Our producers this week were Selena C.A. Reynolds and Carleon Jones. Our newsletter editor is Brooke Lewis, and our executive producer is Laura Eisensee. 
I'm your host, Rahil Ramzanali. Our music is by the band All the Kimonos. We'll be back on Monday with some travel hacks to survive the airport this holiday season. Thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something new. People get disgusted when I tell them this, but it's really not that bad. I just put cold egg whites in my coffee. Oh, my God. No. Yeah. In my cold coffee. Oh, yeah. goodness. We were doing so good. <laughs> it's an icebreaker for sure. You should talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Don't put it in hot coffee because it will get that's nasty because <laughs> it will just cook <laughs> up the eggs. Hey, don't hate it until you try it. And then you can hate it because I think most people still will hate it. <laughs>